Uh, so today's seminar is on animal symbolism in Chinese culture. So this really kind of serves as if you came to our seminar on floral symbolism in Chinese culture, uh, it's sort of a complement to that. I originally did the one on floral symbolism and then realized that it would be a shame to sort of miss out animals as well, uh, since I like animals a lot. Uh, after all, Chinese culture is rich with symbolism and cultural associations that are all vastly different from our own and something that could seem very strange or unusual to us. Uh, so, for example, did you know that bats are considered to be lucky in Chinese culture, as opposed to in the West, where they're often reviled as verminous creatures of the night? Uh, so the first animal I want to talk about today, however, is probably the one we most closely associate with Chinese culture, um, and in particular with certain Chinese buildings. I'm sure everyone knows what I'm talking about right now. And that is, of course, lions. For anyone who's learning Chinese, uh, lion in Chinese is shi uh, zi, a good, good word to know. Uh, so lions guard the doorways to a wide variety of buildings, regardless of their importance, from imperial palaces right down through to your local Chinese restaurant. The tradition of placing a pair of imperial guardian lions on either side of the gates of buildings dates all the way back to at least the Han Dynasty, so around about 206 BC to 220 AD. But there is one distinctive feature about these early lion statues that I'm sure plenty of you will have already noticed and probably thought about at some point in your life, uh, and that is that they really don't actually look anything like lions, and I'm sure this has crossed people's minds many times before. Uh, they are often referred to in English as fool dogs or fool dogs, which should already give you a pretty strong clue as to where the differences came from. Uh, so first of all, it is Asiatic lions that are commonly believed to be the ones depicted in these statues of guardian lions, which may explain why they look so different from the African lions that we're more used to seeing and what we can't commonly associate with lions, typically. Uh, these would have been the first lions that Chinese people would have been introduced to in ancient times. So this is sort of a, a big, another big cultural difference, whereas we in the West came across African lions first. Uh, in China, they came across Asiatic lions first, and they do look very different. Uh, bear in mind, of course, that even Asiatic lions are not indigenous to China and never have been. But numerous historical records indicate that lions were brought as tribute offerings or as curiosities during the Han Dynasty via the Silk Road. According to these records, pelts of lions and sometimes even live lions were brought from places such as Sogdiana and Samarkand, ancient states of Central Asia, and then brought along the Silk Road into the imperial capital of Chang'an, which is now Xi'an, where the terracotta warriors are. For example, a historical document known as the Hou Han Shu, or the Book of Later Han, which was written sometime between 25 AD and 220 AD, contains several instances of lions being brought to the capital as imperial tributes. On one particular occasion, which took place during the 11th lunar month of 87 AD, it was documented that an envoy from Parthia, which is now modern-day northeastern Iran, gifted a lion and an ostrich to the Han court as a tribute. As you can imagine, even a small Asiatic lion was enough to capture the imagination of the imperial court, with Han Chinese people quickly beginning to venerate lions as symbols of power. This is even reflected in its name, as the first character of Shi Zi contains the radical Shi, which means master. You can just see it here. So if you know the word Lao Shi, teacher, it's this bit of the character here. And this bit sort of denotes that it's about an animal. So an animal, some type of animal master. Uh, it is possible that this is simply a phonetic component of the character, since this other radical here, chen, is the old word for dog, which is often used now in association with animals. So, you know, if that gets put into the character, it is an animal of some description and is often included uh, in the names of yeah, most dog-like animals. But it is hard to ignore the nobility that this association brings to the lion, this idea of it being sort of a master among the dog-like animals. The Buddhist monk Hui Lin even went so far as to say that the lions of the Western regions were actually living incarnations of a mythical creature known as a Xuan Ni. So if you cast your minds back, if you were able to join us for our seminar on dragons in Chinese culture and the history of dragons, uh, the Xuan Ni is heralded as one of the nine sons of the dragon. So they were held in pretty high esteem. They were the ones that liked to have a good long sit down. So they're sort of known as being fond of sitting down. Uh, so they're often shown on the bases. If you look at Buddhist statues, you'll see them on the bases, typically under the Buddha's feet or the feet of a bodhisattva. 
In fact, lions have been revered within Buddhism far earlier and have been found in Buddhist art as early as 208 BC. Thus, Buddhist monks travelling along the Silk Road were keen to introduce lions in their religious capacity as the protector of the Dharma, which in a very general sense refers to both cosmic law and order and also the teachings of the Buddha. Due to this connection, they became associated with the concept of protection and guardianship, even as the religious connotations gradually dissipated over time. They became the natural choice as regal beasts that could be used to guard the emperor's gates, as well as the gates of other prominent buildings such as temples, government offices, and the homes of prominent officials. In fact, since the lion's mane was often regarded as a symbol of seniority, the number of coils on the lion's mane would sometimes be used as an indicator of the homeowner's rank as well. For example, a high-ranking official would have up to 13 coils on the manes of the lion statues that guarded his home. Throughout certain dynasties, the lion was also used on the badges of certain officials to denote their rank. Now, the popularity of these guardian lions spread pretty rapidly to other vassal countries to China, which is why you now see them in places like Japan, Korea, Thailand, Burma, Vietnam, and Nepal. Each different dynasty often developed its own styles of guardian lions, but the appearance was eventually standardised and formalised during the Ming and Qing dynasties, so the last two dynasties in Chinese history, the Ming being from 1368 to 1644, and the Qing being from 1644 to 1911. The one common denominator between a lot of these guardian lions, however, is that they often look more like dogs than lions, like I said before. This is because, as you may have guessed, many of these sculptures would have many of the people who carved these sculptures would have never seen a lion in real life, or possibly even an image of a lion. So they would often supplement descriptions they'd read of what lions looked like with the closest possible animal they could think of, which were dogs. Uh, in a weird kind of full circle moment, the Pekingese dog was then bred to look like these guardian lions. So it's not the other way around. It starts off with people looking at images of lions or paintings of lions, uh, reading descriptions, making these guardian lions, which look like a combination between a lion and a dog. And then Pekingese dogs were bred to look like these statues. Uh, so it wasn't the other way. I think a lot of people think the, the, the lions come from the Pekingese dog, but it's the other way around. Uh, now, each of these lines comes as a pair, but can anyone tell me, this is a sort of quiz question, please feel free to write it in the chat. Uh, this lion statue here from the Forbidden City, is it a male or a female? Do you know, there was one very obvious indicator, if you know your lion statues, uh, that will tell you whether it is a male or a female. So is this lion statue a male or a female? Does anyone know? Don't be shy. Feel free to write it in the chat if you know. Someone does know. If people are saying male, mm. now you know from my groan that it's not. Unfortunately, if you said male, you are in the 50% of people that are wrong. Uh, this one is a female. It is a female lion. Cub. There we go. Izzy just said it's cub, so it's a female. And we know that because if you look underneath the paw, there's a lion cub. So the most confusing thing about it is that, oh, Caitlin said can't see whether it has a pearl or a, a cub. But yes, if it's a male, it has a pearl or a ball underneath its paw. And if it's a female, it has a cub. They both have manes because bear in mind, as I said, uh, people never really looked at lions. Most of the people that made the sculptures, so they had no idea that lionesses don't have manes. So they just did both of them with manes. And then the way you would tell is if it has a cub underneath the paw, it's a female. And if it has a ball underneath the paw, it's a male. Uh, so this was a stylistic feature that was solidified during the Ming Dynasty, where the pair of lions would always be gendered, with the female representing yin and placing her paw on the stomach of a cub, while the male represented yang and had his paw placed on top of an embroidered ball. This was to represent the nurturing capacity of the female as a natural mother and the concept of male supremacy, with the embroidered ball symbolising the world. The male statue is almost always on the right of the entrance, whereas the female sits on the left, so it's another way you can tell. In some instances, although this is rarer, it's not standard, the male also has his mouth open and the female has her mouth closed, which together is meant to represent the pronunciation of the beginning of Om Mane Padme Um, which is a sutra from Buddhism. 
You may have noticed, however, that the female has a mane, which is another strong hint that many of the artisans working on these statues, as I said, would have never seen actual lions. And that many of the lions that were brought to the imperial court were male. So people may not have even known originally that lionesses did not have manes. Some designs also place a large pearl in each of the lion's mouths, which can roll around freely, but is too large to be removed. Bear in mind that when these statues were placed outside of imperial tombs or palaces, it was because the lion was believed to have almost mythical protective powers. For this reason, they were also frequently used on door knockers or in pottery, for those people who weren't wealthy enough to afford their own pair of stone lions. Generally speaking, they were carved from decorative stone, such as marble or granite, but they could also be cast from metals, just like bronze or iron. Historically, the expensive materials and amount of labour required to make them meant that only wealthy or elite families would have their own pair of guardian lions, so it was a real sort of status symbol. Nowadays, however, it's not uncommon to see guardian lions large or small, gracing the entrances of hotels, restaurants, and sometimes even supermarkets in China. Now, alongside the guardian lions, one of the most recognisable cultural associations when it comes to lions is the lion dance, which depicts two lions chasing a ball. I'm sure some people may have seen it before. Uh, For the sake of brevity, however, I won't be going into any depth on the lion dance as we've got other animals to look at. Uh, In fact, the next animal may not seem like the most obvious, but it is one of the most, if not, I would say the most uh, culturally significant animal in terms of Chinese art and design. And that may surprise you. And that is the bat. So for anyone who's learning Chinese as well, uh, bat in Chinese is bianfu. And the pronunciation of its name is actually super important as to why, as you can see here, it is considered so important in uh, Chinese art and motif. In fact, you know, I went for years and years not realizing that these were bats. If you look at all of the motifs in China, they're really well hidden, which is, I think, why a lot of people don't really know that bats are so important in Chinese art. But if you look closely, you'll see so many of them once you start noticing them. It's really creepy. It's like a really uncanny thing that starts happening. As soon as you realize that they're, they're everywhere, you see them everywhere kind of weird. Uh, So while bats continue to be reviled in the Western world, as I said, as sort of verminous creatures, in China they are celebrated as one of the most auspicious animals. Uh, Images of bats have graced the finest pottery, murals, architecture, and all manner of artistic works in the country from as early as the Han Dynasty, so again 206 BC to 220 AD. This vase, for example, dates back to the Qing Dynasty, so 1644 to 1911, and is currently on display in the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. As you can see, it is totally covered in bats, and it's designed to look like a bottle gourd as well. All of this has been thanks to a linguistic trick. The second character in the name of bat, or fu, is a homonym for one of the most culturally significant and auspicious words in Chinese, that of fu, which means blessing or good fortune. You will undoubtedly have seen this character before, either pasted on the doors of people's houses uh, in China during spring festival period, or hung on the back wall of your favourite Chinese takeaway. It's pretty much, this character is kind of, much like bats, it's kind of inescapable. Uh, during Spring Festival, the character Fu, you may have also noticed if you've been in China during Spring Festival, they hang it upside down, since the word Dao, or to invert or to hang upside down, is again another homonym for the word Dao, which means to arrive. So it's a symbol for saying they want to invert it is to want happiness to arrive at your home. Uh, In this way, as I said, the cultural association between bats and the arrival of good fortune was further reinforced by the fact that the bats, of course, famously sleep hanging upside down. So it couldn't be any more perfect. Not only do bats have a character in their name that sounds like the character for blessing or good fortune, they also sleep upside down, much like when you turn the character upside down. Now, red bats, as you can see here, were particularly potent symbol of good fortune in China, since red is also the most auspicious colour in Chinese culture. Uh, This is not so surprising when you consider the fact that most animals that could fly were associated with heaven, and the bat was particularly special, since it is the only mammal that can truly fly. Um, Oh, sorry. For this reason, historically, it was also known as the, I love this, Tian Shu or the heavenly rat, which I think is really cute. I love bats, so I feel like we should start calling them heavenly rats in uh, in English as well. Uh, from a practical perspective, bats would often eat flying insects that plagued the country's farmers, so they were welcome arrivals in China's rural communities as well. 
Alongside their association with good fortune, there are also legends about white bats that could live for thousands of years. So they were also connected with the concept of longevity. So they're kind of an all around great animal. Uh, this is why a common motif on Chinese porcelain is peaches surrounded by bats, as these were both popular symbols of longevity. In fact, the body parts of bats were frequently used, of course, in traditional Chinese medicine as elixirs for long life. Although nowadays, of course, the consumption of bats carries with it a very serious taboo. Uh, the motif of two bats together is representative of the Chinese character for double happiness as well. But they were more commonly depicted in groups of five. So you often see bats in groups of five. Not so much here, though, where it's just lots of bats. Groups of five bats were designed to represent what are known as the Wu Fu, or the five blessings. You can see here five, and then here the character Fu, meaning blessing. Uh, the term Wu Fu has a long history in China, as it was originally cited in the classic of history, or the Shu Jin, which dates all the way back to the Zhou dynasty, so around about 1045 to 256 BC. It's one of the oldest texts, one of the five classics. In the classic of history, these five blessings were referred to as longevity, wealth, health and, com health and composure, love of virtue, and the desire to have a peaceful death in old age. So five things that you should want in life. Longevity, wealth, health and composure, love of virtue, and the desire to have a peaceful death. I think that's something we can all kind of relate to uh, in old age specifically, not just a desire to have peaceful death. Although this changed briefly during the Han Dynasty, when love of virtue was replaced with prosperity in government, uh, nowadays they have been solidified simply as health, wealth, virtue, longevity, and peace in death. Those are the five blessings. Thus, a group of five bats is meant to depict a wish for these five blessings in life. Uh, there are three main motifs that utilise these five bats as well. The first, which you can see here, is known as Wu Fu Peng Shou. Uh, within this motif, the five bats surround the stylized character of shou, which you can see here, which means uh, longevity. This motif, of course, really emphasizes the concept of long life and is quite popular in Chinese architecture, as families believe the blessing will be passed on to their descendants as well. Now, the next motif is known as wu fu he he, which is an image of the five bats surrounding a round box. The words he he literally translate to mean and a box. But he, as you can probably already guess, is a homonym for he. I don't know why I'm saying it over and over again. It sounds the exact same. Uh, but that means harmony. Uh, the word he also has associations with the concept of harmony. This one, this he, this, this one, not this one, this one. Just in case anyone's getting confused, that one has associations with the concept of harmony. So this particular motif expresses the wish for someone to have a blissful and harmonious life. It is frequently used on objects that are given to newly married couples in the hopes that they will have a harmonious marriage. Now, the final motif is known as Wu Fu Lin Men, which is most commonly used as a blessing to relatives, particularly during Spring Festival. This ties the bat in with its linguistic origins, as it shows the group of five bats typically surrounding the character Fu, this one here, meaning blessing. At the start of Spring Festival, many families will post red paper with this motif on their door, in the hopes that the five blessings will be bestowed upon them in the coming year. Uh, now, before we head into our uh, break for the day, let's take a look at some of the less desirable animals in Chinese culture, which also conveniently come in a group of five, so it makes quite a nice segue for me as well. So five animals that you don't really want to come across, and those are the five poisons known in Chinese as wu du. Uh, so this gauze that you see here dates all the way back to the Ming Dynasty, so between 1368 and 1644. And if you want to have a look at it, it's currently on display at the Met Museum in New York, as far as I'm aware, last time I checked. Uh, not that I've been, but it said so on the website. Although the patterning is quite subtle, if you look very carefully, you should be able to find all of the five poisonous creatures on here, which are known in Chinese as Wu Du, or five poisons. Now, these five most reviled creatures are the snake, or in Chinese, shi, the scorpion, xie, or sometimes the spider, zhi, zhu, the centipede, also known as wu gong, which gives me nightmares because centipedes in China are not the same as centipedes in the UK. They're horrifying, kind of like xenomorphic, alien-looking creatures. Look them up. Look up the Chinese red-headed centipede. 
and I encountered it a handful of times while I was there. Truly, the stuff I can understand why they've they called it a poison. Horrifying. Uh, you also have the gecko, bee hole, or sometimes just the lizard, and then finally the toad, hama. I'm sure you're all wondering, however, if these creatures were so hated, why do you have them on your textile? So why do you sort of beautifully embroider them onto your textile? with such sort of delicate care. Well, these sort of objects were designed to protect you from the dangerous creatures depicted on them. On the fifth day of the fifth lunar month, the Chinese people celebrate what's known as the Duan Wu Festival, which is more often referred to in English as the Dragon Boat Festival. While we tend to associate the festival with the exhilarating dragon boat races from which it gets its English name, it actually has a much darker association. So since the fifth day of the fifth lunar month traditionally heralded the start of summer, it was also seen as one of the most inauspicious and dangerous days of the year. This was because it was the day when all of the most poisonous or venomous animals would either come out of hibernation or start to breed, which meant you were constantly at risk of stepping on a venomous snake or encountering an obscenely aggressive red-headed centipede during your daily life. I can attest to this. This is the, it's the time period when the red-headed centipede emerges from hibernation, and it is truly horrifying it's just they're massive and they're really aggressive uh, so on top of that it was typically one of the hottest days of the year and according to traditional chinese medicine this excessive heat would undoubtedly lead to illness if it was left unchecked this belief is not totally unfounded as humidity related diseases were and continue to be a prevalent threat particularly in the south of china now, perhaps their scientific belief in ancient China stated that the only way to combat poison was to ingest poison. It's something that we also have in the Western world historically. Uh, so people would drink real go wine during the festival, which contains small amounts of uh, arsenic sulfide. Not very healthy. In some cases, they would also mix cinnabar into their wine, which again contains mercury. So not something you really want to be drinking. Families would also hang images of the deity Zhonghui in the hopes that he would protect them from the five poisons and other common humidity-related diseases. Now, another really bizarre, albeit uncommon, custom involved what was known as the gu poison, which has achieved a degree of infamy due to the way in which it was made. So in order to make gu poison, you first, so poison poison, uh, you first had to seal several venomous creatures inside of a closed container. Now, usually these, this, this is really bizarre, by the way, so brace yourselves. Usually these creatures will be picked from the five poisons, with the most common being the centipede, the scorpion and the snake, also probably the easiest ones to catch. Uh, these creatures would then be forced to fight until they had eaten one another, uh, with the toxin supposedly concentrated into the single survivor. Uh, sadly, the ordeal was not yet over for this sole survivor, as it would be killed and its body would be fed to larvae. The last surviving lava was the one that held the poison, so the most concentrated poison. It was believed that ghoul poison could be used to ward off the five poisons, but it was also used in black magic to manipulate romantic partners, cause people to develop malignant diseases, and sometimes even to cause death. As you can imagine, when you force a bunch of venomous creatures to fight each other and then eat the one that wins. Uh, the most common custom during this festival, however, was the making, giving and wearing of what are known as five poison charms and amulets, or wu du qian. So five poison money in Chinese, uh, such as the ones shown here that date back to the Ming Dynasty. They're quite pretty. I really like them, even though they contain poisons. Uh, in Chinese, they are literally known as five poison money. And as you can see here, they are shaped like ancient Chinese coins. They are actually part of a wider tradition in China known as Yang Sheng coins or ye, oh, sorry, Yan Sheng coins or Yan Sheng Qian, or sometimes Chinese numismatic charms, which are special decorative coins that weren't legal tender and instead had a ritual function, such as use in fortune telling or as protective talismans. Five poison amulets, as you can see here, contain depictions of the five poisonous animals and were customarily given to children by their parents during the festival so that they could be worn around the child's neck. The parents might also hang a small pouch filled with mugwort around the child's neck, which played a similarly protective function. In some variations, you may even notice that the tiger is considered to be a member of the five poisons, but this isn't because they were believed to be poisonous or even dangerous. Tigers were known to be solitary animals, and in Chinese, the word for solitary, or gu, has a similar pronunciation to the Chinese word for poison, or du. 
Some historians have theorized, however, that the taiga only appears on these coins because of the connection to Chu Yuan, uh, who was born on the Taiga Day. So anyone who knows the uh, Dragon Boat Festival probably knows the very sad story of Chu Yuan. Uh, the story of Chu Yuan is the basis for the Dragon Boat Festival. Uh, without going into too much detail about it, because it, I'm sure some people have heard it to death and it it's quite long. Uh, Chi Yuan was a loyal statesman during the Warring States period, so 476 to 221 BC, before China was unified. Now, he tried to warn the Duke of Chu about the conniving state of Qin, but his warnings went unheeded. When his beloved state was conquered by the state of Qin, he famously threw himself into the river and drowned. Uh, the dragon boat races then on this day are actually meant to represent the boats of fishermen as they paddled out to try and save his life. Uh, so on that very cheerful note, let's have our five minute break. And uh, I thought my stupid image for today for a five minute break is a picture of bats. When you uh, flip it upside down, it looks like they're having a dance off, which I really like. And also bats are just great. Perfect. Uh, so I wonder if anyone can guess what our next animal is going to be. It is, in fact, the tortoise, of course, also known in Chinese as gui. Uh, so the significance of the tortoise in Chinese culture is undeniable. I'm sure people have come across tortoises before, certainly in Chinese temples, uh, in Chinese motifs, in movies like Kung Fu Panda, uh, which aren't Chinese but draw on Chinese culture. Uh, so I've put here um, tortoise or turtle because there's not such a huge distinction historically between the two animals. We'll just jump in the uh, chat. Uh, in Chinese, a tortoise is known as gui, and a turtle is known simply as hai gui, or a sea tortoise. Uh, the most famous turtle in Chinese mythology was known as ao, who was a giant sea turtle that was believed to live in the South China Sea and existed during the formation of the world. You can actually see Al at the bottom here of this brush part dating back to the Qing dynasty. So this is him getting having his head stood on uh, with the deity Kui Xing, the god of literature, just kind of standing on his head. Uh, in fact, this image is pretty much emblematic of Al's bad luck. So according to one particular legend, the goddess Nuwa, who is the creator of mankind, she uh, took earth up and made people in uh, the Chinese um, uh, origin story, uh, she chopped off Al's four legs and used them as supports when she was repairing the sky. Uh, in other myths, he comes off a little bit better, as he is said to still be alive and he re resides in the Bohai Sea, where it is his job to carry the three islands of the eight immortals, Peng Lai, Fang Zheng, and Ying Zhou, on his back. So uh, he is getting his head stepped on, he's having his legs cut off, or he's carrying islands on his back, so he doesn't really have the best luck. Uh, so if you cast your mind back again to uh, if you came to the seminar on uh, dragons and the history of dragons in China, you may remember that one of the nine sons of the dragon was known as Bi Xi and looked like a half dragon, half tortoise. Uh, the BC is known for its ability to carry enormous weights on its back and is often depicted holding memorial steels. For this reason, it's believed that the legend of the BC probably originated from the legend of Ao carrying these um, islands on his back. Historically, it was also believed that if Al appeared to you in your dreams, it was the sign that you were going to pass the imperial examinations. For this reason, images such as this one, with Al depicted alongside Kui Xing, the god of literature, were designed to wish prospective officials good luck during the examinations. Now, Kui Xing's connection with Al runs a little bit deeper, however, as one of the legends associated with this deity recounts how a turtle rescued him after he tried to commit suicide by throwing himself into the sea. Uh, and apparently the best way he could think of to thank that turtle was to stand on his head. Uh, so not all that great for the turtle. Poor Al. Uh, so this image here, by contrast, is a sculpture of a tortoise that dates all the way back to the Han Dynasty. So again, 206 BC to 220 AD, which demonstrates what a long heritage this animal has as a cultural symbol in the country. Now, if you look closely here, you may have noticed that the Chinese character for turtle or tortoise has changed. So here we have this one, and suddenly something a little bit different. Uh, now, this is in fact the traditional character for tortoise, and it's closer to the original classical Chinese, like all traditional characters, which gives us some hints about how tortoises were conceived of in ancient China. The character here shows a head like a little snake at the top, just here, Paws to the middle, um, to the middle left. You've got all these tiny little paws here. Um, a snake like, oh, sorry, a shell on the right, which you can see just here, and then a little tail at the bottom. So you've got his little head here, little paws here, little shell here, and then little tail just here. 
Uh, this image of the tortoise with a long snake-like neck and a dragon-like face has become arguably the most iconic in China, in part thanks to what are known as the four auspicious beasts. The four auspicious beasts, also known as the four symbols or the four guardians, are four mythological creatures that appear among the Chinese constellations and are believed to guard the four cardinal directions. Now, these are the azure dragon, who belongs to the east, the vermilion bird of the south, the white tiger of the west, and of course, the black tortoise of the north, the one I'm going to be talking about right now. Now, as I mentioned, if you came to our seminar on five element theory, the black tortoise's Chinese name actually means, so Xuan Wu here means black or dark warrior. Xuan doesn't really mean black. Hei, Hazel means black. Xuan has these connotations of something that's dark and kind of like esoteric. So uh, dark hidden knowledge, but sometimes referred to as black. Uh, and it's often depicted with a snake wrapped around it, since the tortoise and the snake were both associated with longevity. In fact, it was conventionally believed that a tortoise could live up to 10,000 years. As a testament to its power and strength, the Chinese Imperial Army would carry flags with images of dragons and tortoises on them to signify their military strength. This was because the tortoise was one of the only animals that could supposedly fight with a dragon and live to tell the tale. Since the dragon cannot break the tortoise's shell, but equally the tortoise cannot reach the dragon if it chooses to flee by flying away, because tortoises cannot fly. Uh, from a more visceral and practical perspective, however, evidence dating back to the Shang Dynasty, so 1600 to 1046 BC, very long time ago in Chinese history, indicates that tortoise shells were used for divination practices and contained inscribed on them some of the earliest examples of Chinese writing, which is known as oracle bone script because it's either used, it's either written on bone or it's written on these tortoise shells, uh, and it of course was used by oracles. It was used for fortune telling. Some legends even recount how Chinese characters were actually based on the original markings that were found on the backs of certain tortoises. Uh, this is because during these divination ceremonies, the tortoise shell would be heated from underneath until a pattern of cracks formed. And this pattern of cracks was meant to provide an answer to the question that had been written on the shell or asked by the diviner. From a slightly more adorable perspective, three tortoises stacked on top of one another are meant to represent a mother and her babies in Chinese culture. Now we move on to our next animal, one I'm sure you may not have suspected, uh, the cricket, also known in Chinese as Xi Shuai. Uh, the Chinese painters here, um, anyone who is interested in tra traditional Chinese painting, will undoubtedly recognise this painting, which is a pet cricket shown outside of his bottle gourd, and it was painted by the wildly, hugely famous Chinese painter Qi Bai Shi. Uh, you may remember as well, if you came to, uh, if we've ever been to a seminar where I talked about bottle gourds before, that bottle gourds were actually designed, it was in the floral symbolism seminar as well, uh, these gourds were specifically designed to hold pet crickets. So the association with crickets and bottle gourds is pretty strong. Uh, now, the tradition of keeping crickets as pets in China is believed to date all the way back to the Zhou dynasty, and the insects featured in Chinese literature from as early as 1000 BC. In the beginning, however, they were only kept for what, were, uh, what are known as their singing capabilities, which is something that only male crickets do. Unlike in the Western world, where we were often preoccupied with larger mammals as symbols of strength and power, Chinese scholars of antiquity would often look to the insect world for such symbols of strength. For example, the praying mantis came to symbolize bravery, while the cicada was associated with resurrection, because of course it spent a long time dormant and then just suddenly comes out, and the silkworm was of course one of the greatest economic assets in the country. In fact, in an ancient Chinese text known as the Urya, which dates back to sometime between 500 BC and 200 BC, and is thus the first known dictionary in Chinese history, there is an entire section dedicated to just insects. The oldest surviving cricket home, so to speak, one of these bottle gourds, was discovered in a tomb and dates back to 960 AD. Now, paintings from the 12th century indicate that by this time, there was an entire art surrounding the construction of clay cricket homes, and Chinese people had developed a sophisticated way of handling crickets. In particular, they had figured out that you could tickle crickets to stimulate them into singing, and also to stimulate them into fighting each other. 
That being said, the only reliable historical data we have regarding cricket fights dates back to the Song Dynasty, so 960 to 1279 AD. Although there are speculations that it may have started during the Tang Dynasty, so 618 to 906 AD. You may be surprised to hear that cricket fighting and singing were not confined to the realms of the lower classes either. They were favoured pets of many emperors in China, including Emperor Xuanzong of the Tang Dynasty, one of the most sort of celebrated emperors in Chinese history. For this reason, numerous scholars wrote treaties on the proper care and handling of crickets, with the oldest one being the Book of Crickets, known as the Zhu Zhi Jing, by the celebrated Song Dynasty minister Jia Si Dao, who is said to have had a particular fondness for the insect itself. Although the original text has sadly been lost, we know of its existence due to references in later texts about crickets. Within it, Jia Si Dao famously claimed that raising crickets was like rearing a group of soldiers. By the Qing dynasty, cricket fighting had become a popular pastime among the commoners of Beijing, so much so that the imperial court would often request that commoners pay their taxes in the form of high quality fighting crickets. How amazing is that? This practice is most famously documented in Pu Songling's short story, A Cricket Boy, which can be found in his anthology of short stories, Strange Tales from a Chinese Studio, which you can get as an English translation. If you were there for the, set, the sort of Halloween special I did, I also provided a link uh, where you can read it all online as well. So it is free online under the Gutenberg project. In this short story, a peasant is cruelly told by the Xuande Emperor that he must find the strongest prize fighting cricket in the kingdom. In the end, the man's cricket miraculously is able to defeat all of the emperor's finest crickets. But it is revealed that the commoner's cricket was actually being guided by his son, who was sleeping at the time and dreaming he was the cricket. Now, uh, as I've mentioned uh, in the floral symbolism seminar, if you were there for that, talking about sort of bottle gourds and crickets. Alongside building custom clay homes for your cricket, it was also popular to house these crickets within moulded gourds. So you sort of protect the gourd so it doesn't uh, rot, and then you create a little house for your cricket. This was, however, exclusively done uh, by the Forbidden City, and commoners were forbidden from producing these specialist gourds. So this was something that only the emperor and uh, government officials were allowed to do. The royal gardeners within the imperial palace would place the fruit inside of an earthen mould, which thus... Oh, I'm so sorry which thus forced it to take up the desired shape as it grew into maturity. This art had reached its peak during the 18th century, when the gardeners were able to produce both reusable carved wooden moulds and disposable clay moulds. Oh, it's going again. Most importantly, however, the shapes of the gourds were actually tailored to the different species of cricket as well. Larger gourds were used for larger species, of course. Long bottle gourds were used for species that were capable of jumping long distances, so they had a bit more space, and so on. Now, if you ever notice a gourd being held by a member of the royal family in an imperial portrait, that is actually a container with a prized cricket inside, which was a symbol of high status. It was said that the Yongzheng Emperor was so protective of his prized cricket that he would even sleep with the gourd in his hand, so he would sleep with his cricket next to him. Uh, the monopoly on these moulded gourds was lifted during the 1800s, thanks to the Jiajing Emperor, but they were so insanely expensive that only members of the upper class could afford them. And this is just the container, not the crickets. Alongside bottle gourds, there were a wide variety of other containers that were used to house crickets. So, for example, in the photo you can see, see here, we have what's known as, the, as a guolong ar, which was a container with a lid on the top and a hole at each end. These specialised containers could hold two crickets, specifically a male and a female. This was because without the presence of the female, the male cricket couldn't be stimulated really to fight the other male. Uh, other containers included things like the shui shao or ar, which were shallow porcelain bowls where crickets could have a drink, and also the guan ar, which were containers made out of porcelain or pottery that had lids on the tops and holes on the bottom. Now, if you've ever seen the film The Last Emperor, made in 1987, a classic, uh, you may have also noticed that Emperor Pu Yi's flashbacks are triggered after he opens up a black box, which is the container for his beloved prize-fighting cricket as well. So don't discount the cricket. It has an incredibly interesting history in China. And that is our final animal for today. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. If you do have to leave... Um, I understand. It's all right. But if you want to join in our discussion or if you have any questions, please feel free to. Uh, so for our final discussion. Oh, no, you can end the recording as well now. Sorry.